I'm a recruiter. It's a small, small, small industry. Smaller than you'd think. Same with HR. So if you're looking for a job or maybe trying to keep a job, think about what you're putting on social media. Again, freedom fighters. I know you're not really big with stats and, you know, facts aren't your thing, you know, but what I can tell you, what is a fact is that recruiters talk and recruiters like the majority of Canada don't agree with you. Well, that sounds illegal. Maybe not in Canada, but it definitely seems like you should be able to sue the crap out of whatever company she works for if she fired you for political beliefs that you spoke about outside of the job. Because that's certainly what she's suggesting she would do. Do you know what that means? Do you have any guesses? Any guesses what that means? What that means is that if you need a job, you might not get one. If you want to keep a job, you might not get to do that. And you think we can't do anything, but we can. We have the power. Always remember that. Doesn't matter if there's a fucking man at the top of your HR department. It's run by women. And it's run by angry women just like me. That seemed kind of sexist. Honestly, if I was her employer, she would be fired right on the spot after I found this. You mean you publicly admitted that you would put my company at risk of being sued because someone went to a protest that you didn't like? Yeah, you're fired. Actually, I believe she was fired for this, so ironically, maybe she should be careful about what she posts on social media. Recruiters are watching. HR is watching everywhere. And we hate you. We hate you so much. <sighs> I'm so, so glad I got that off my chest. It's been eating me up inside. And honestly, my heart goes out to you guys. I mean, you have families to feed, right? Big Brother is watching you, and we would definitely take away your ability to feed your family over some petty political disagreements. Wow, that seems very empathetic of you. Isn't that what HR is supposed to be about? Spreading empathy and tolerance of diverse groups of people in the workplace? Or is this all just a grift that some really bigoted people use to justify their paychecks so they don't get laid off? Let's get into it, but first, so if you've ever worked a job before, then chances are you've been around a human resources department. HR is a faction of a company that was originally designed to help businesses keep up with employment legislation, but has now turned into a faction that gatekeeps, babies employees, and imposes irrelevant political ideology onto workers instead of focusing on helping the company make the best quality product. How did we get here? Well, this might answer it. This is Juliet Samuel, who wrote an article for The Telegraph about how HR is harming the workplace. Over the last probably decade, particularly since the financial crisis in, in financial uh, companies, but also in the public sector, um, this question of company culture uh, came to the fore. And the idea that, you know, if you could uh, manage a bank, in, uh, manage a bank's culture, then you could avoid things like, you know, the financial crisis. That the financial crisis wasn't a question of low interest rates and misguided regulation. and It was a question of toxic masculinity or, or mm. something like mm. that. That actually makes no sense at all. Well, it kind of makes sense considering that places like California have literally written gender quotas into legislation. But somebody honestly thought that virtue signaling was the answer to financial crisis which means there's a segment of people who know nothing about business who actually think this stuff works. And instead of thinking, well, you know, workplace culture is usually set by the managers. And so if they're a good person and they manage things well, then, you know, and they listen to people, then usually things are OK. It started to become, no, no, this is a specialism. It needs to be regulated. It needs to be discussed. Um, there need to be guidelines and policies and handbooks. And so it grew into this, you know, bureaucratic, um, uh, sort of towering bureaucratic edifice. And then um, you had imported into that a lot of radical ideology, which maybe we'll come yeah, to. Yeah. Oh, you mean like exactly what they did with schools? They standardized every part of the lesson plan and allowed teachers very little freedom in what they want to teach. They did this instead of doing the smart thing, which is hiring qualified teachers for each subject and allowing for an individualized lesson plan. Then you add in tenure, which makes it extremely difficult to fire bad teachers, and now you have a terrible education system that everyone complains about. But the problem for companies is even worse than that. Why is the CEO of a major company scared of the personnel manager? And a large part of the reason for that is the ideology that has now entered companies via the HR department 
Um, and what people are scared of, what managers are scared of, is, is being caught out, being caught on the wrong side of this movement, that which they know is very vicious, which they uh, feel to be very powerful, although, you know, is actually probably not as powerful as it, as it presents itself. This is just a guess, but it sounds to me like this is all a complete hostile takeover after a recession. You give one segment of the company the ability to recruit and onboard your employees. Those people are all or mostly college educated. So for the past decade or more, they've been taught that capitalism is evil. They have been taught CRT. They have been taught modern feminism. And they have been taught other woke ideologies. People who believe those ideologies are incredibly intolerant of other belief systems, as you saw in the intro clip. So they mostly or exclusively hire people who are like them which leads to a corporate culture where people are afraid to speak up because they aren't in the majority, whereas the majority party is willing to go to extreme ends to get their way. Or the woke people at the company are truly in the minority, and they get their way anyway because they are willing to get violent, whereas others aren't. It sounds a lot like bullying. Oh wait, here's the best part. HR is actually, what's, one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's actually a conduit now for other other forces and there are two main forces in this sort of area that you're talking about and one is charity the charitable sector so groups like stonewall um for whom frankly a lot of this is a money-making yeah. scheme so we have this you have the stonewall diversity champion scheme i think it is where yeah. effectively companies um pay stonewall as a charity to assess them and to certify them as you know you are this good a gold medal or a you know, or a bronze yeah. medal yeah, yeah, at, yeah. at being friendly to, um, to, to gay employees. Um, and so the HR department, you know, will often say, how do we deal with this, with this problem? We're going to hire a charity to do it. And if they tell us what we have to do and we do it, then, then, then we've done it. That doesn't sound like a charity. That sounds like a for-profit business that charges for seminars and also happens to take donations. Who exactly are they charitable to? In my unprofessional opinion, after watching four seasons of Ozark, it sounds like a way to launder money. I did some research, and this Stonewall Diversity Champions Company also lobbies for legislation. Isn't that a conflict of interest? Who's to say they won't lobby for a law that mandates some sort of seminar in their favor? So now, theoretically, we have a hostile takeover of HR, likely after the 2008 crisis. Then you have opportunistic certification companies who lean into this stuff for profit, then you add in people like Robin D'Angelo, who charges an average of $14,000 per speech, and you can understand that the diversity and inclusion grift is big money. And that, in my opinion, is how we got here. Also, some companies like Riot Games are using this woke stuff as a cover-up to move people's attention away from some of the illegal and immoral stuff they were doing. So there is that, too. A number of companies have gone woke as a PR scheme. Now, I know from a superficial standpoint, it is really easy for these grifter organizations to make it look like they are providing a valuable product, but when you actually look into it, it's not that impressive. For example, here's a training video for unconscious bias from a small technology firm you may have heard of called Google. What would the world look like if everybody were aware of the stereotypes that they have and the biases that they have? These biases, they're the shortcuts that our brain has created so that we can deal with the information that we process every single day. Okay, yeah, I'm with you. Certainly you guys opened up with an idea that pretty much everyone can agree on. Our brains create shortcuts that make our lives easier. Now let's hear about how those shortcuts make you a bad person. Right when we see anyone, whether we think about it or not, we are implicitly, automatically making judgments about how warm and competent that person or thing is. People are very wedded to the idea that they can perceive something objectively and statistically they're wrong, but it's hard. You become attached to this idea that you can assess something by looking at it. Uh, you absolutely can assess something by looking at it. A lot of times that is an essential skill for survival. For example, New York City. Why do people still live there? I have no idea. But for the sake of argument, let's look at a video recorded in a New York City subway cart. Now at first, we see a man who has taken a mannequin with him on the train and appears to be carrying a bottle of liquor. This woman in front notices that and steps away from him. Obviously, she's a bigot. Let's continue. Come on, sit down properly! Why you wearing no pants today? 
Now we see him yelling and yet another woman steps away from him, obviously because she is deeply prejudiced. Let's see the final clip. You have some, Wilson, have some! Why are you recording that? Wilson, have some! This is 49th Street. I've been drinking all day, Wilson, have some! More people start walking away as the man, who apparently is a fan of the movie Castaway, continues to yell and tries to feed his mannequin what appears to be alcohol. All these people are showing deep-seated prejudice from their unconscious bias. I'm not going to show it, but the man then proceeds to get violent with the mannequin, destroys it, and walks off the train with just its leg. Now let me tell you why these people are bigots. That guy on the train could have been doing some sort of theater practice for his drama class at the local college. He could have been filming a YouTube social experiment. How do they know? Why did they have to be so judgmental and assume he was dangerous? But let me ask you this. Are those two options at all likely? Or is it far more likely that considering his behaviors, this person is mentally ill and a violent threat to these people, and that's why they stepped away from him? That action keeps them safe. By the way, don't think that it's not the goal of these programs to get rid of all bias. They literally say it. Here's a pro-unconscious bias video saying that. Bias is very much real, and it's something that we as individuals need to continue being aware of, checking, and unlearning. But I shouldn't even have to show you a video like this to give you an example, because I'm sure you've all seen this narrative of, we cannot judge, it's impossible to judge, everyone is the same. Anyway, let's continue with the video from Google. I want to hear a bias that I'm wrong about. I grew up surrounded with this conversation about what you can't do and what you won't be able to do. My name's Enrico, and uh, I'm an autistic software engineer. I had no idea that software engineers were known for their social skills. But okay, I'm glad he was able to succeed. How else is unconscious bias a problem? All humans need to make decisions, and so we fill in the blanks because our brains are wired to do that, and we fill in with things we don't know with, you know, past experience. Oh, you pattern map to someone I think I should hire, so I'm going to hire you versus this person because they didn't map because I can't fill in the blank because they don't look like me or they're not from my same background, and so I can't see how they're going to make the jump. Quite honestly, I think this is an incredibly racist narrative that is predominantly perpetrated by woke people because they are the only ones who are categorizing people by race and gender. Everyone else just looks for the most qualified candidate instead of people who look like them. And it's a narrative that appears to be mostly aimed at black people, to which I would find incredibly insulting if I were black. Speaking of biases being factually wrong, how many times have we heard woke people say that black people cannot relate to characters who aren't black? Well, as this comic from Stone Toss Comics points out, black people have zero problem relating to Goku from Dragon Ball, Anime is extremely popular in the black community. Traditionally, so are Bruce Lee movies. These stories contain very few people who look like them, yet they are well-loved in that community, and I think it's insulting to say a person is only able to relate to a character, or someone is only able to relate to another person if they have the same skin color. It's also racist. But wait, there's more. When I was talking about that guy on the train possibly filming a YouTube video or practicing his acting skills in public, it may sound like I was being hyperbolic. But trust me, I wasn't. These diversity programs literally say things like that. During my research, I found a training company called M-Train. Let's look at an example from them about how you might inappropriately judge a situation because of your unconscious bias. Uh, let's see. It's the dry cleaners down on mission. Two blocks up, you know, you yeah, know, you yeah. know. Uh, I need the red shirt and I'll see you later. All right. Obviously, they want you to think that this was a drug deal. Did you guys guess that it was actually a guy trying to get his dry cleaning done? Um, no. Why would anyone think that? First of all, he has no clothes with him, but you might say, well, he's having the other guy pick up the clothes for him. Riddle me this then. How is he going to pick up the dry cleaning without a ticket? The guy leaning on the wall hands the ticket or whatever that piece of paper is to the guy with the money after getting paid. They didn't even take the time to contextually get the interaction right, so you would feel bad about getting the answer wrong. Man, the people who created this were really lazy. It gets worse. Look at this. Yeah, dude. That function's not due until the next sprint. Well, Sophia said that we No, are... I appreciate Sophia's concern, but... We all agreed on these dates. She said she wrote the date down wrong. Well, that's her problem. 
But wait, I... Did you guess that guy was actually a valet and not the CEO of a Fortune 500 company? Well, if not, you're a bigot. Again, why would anyone guess that? Quite frankly, if I found out that a valet synced his phone to my car speakers and used it to make phone calls, I would be pissed. Now, I would like to say that this stuff is just affecting the West, but unfortunately, these woke training courses are actually a global thing, which makes me quite suspicious about the real motive of their use. It might actually be a little less organic of a movement than I initially suggested. And again, this stuff is literally calling regular people evil for making reasonable assumptions. Thank you, thanks. By the way, you're looking very nice. Oh, thank you, sir. Acha cha, appraisal meeting. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get it, you'll get it. Excuse me. Oh. Good morning, Shahin. What happened? Don't even ask, yeah. You know that Mishra ji, he thought I'm dressed like this just to impress the boss. Can you believe that? Men know. What the hell? Of course you're going to dress nice if you are about to be evaluated. Her reaction is ridiculous. I mean, imagine having to work with a person like that in real life who gets mad at a compliment and words of encouragement. So after this video goes over a couple of examples of bias, all the actors go to like an unconscious bias group therapy meeting. Take a look. It's all of you. You're all guilty of unconscious bias. What bias? Unconscious bias. You judged me because of my disability. Excuse me? Look who's talking. You judge me just because of the dress I'm wearing. Women don't dress just to impress people, by the way. Absolutely everyone dresses well to impress and get validation from other people. Why else would I go through all the work it takes to pick a proper outfit, iron my clothes, shave, and style my hair? I mean, who makes these things? They literally turned a guy saying, hey, you look nice today. I'm sure you'll do well in your evaluation into an insult rooted in deep prejudice and hatred of women. No wonder these people are trying to censor everything. Their ideas are ridiculous and not very well thought out. These ideas can only survive in the absence of criticism. And the crazy thing here is that they even admit that this stuff is nonsense. Let's go back to that video I clipped earlier where the girl during the credits is saying that we need to unlearn biases. Again, this is a video that is in favor of unconscious bias training, and even they say that the test for it doesn't work. The IAT is part of many implicit bias trainings. It's supposed to establish a baseline for each participant's unconscious biases by measuring them. The problem is, we don't actually know if it does that. If you want to use it as a diagnostic measure of how racist or sexist you are or something like that, it's not going to tell you that. There you have it. That's a researcher who works for a company that does implicit bias testing, and he says that it cannot be used for the primary reason that the woke radicals are using it for. Now why is that? A psychological test is usually measured in two ways, reliability and validity. Test-retest reliability means that people should be able to take the test over and over again and get nearly the same results each time. A perfect reliability score is a 1, but a test is solid if it scores at least 0.7. But studies have put the race IAT's reliability at 0.44, and the IAT overall at 0.5, well below acceptable standards. This means when a person takes the test multiple times, they get notably different results. So basically, this test has zero validity. If you can take it a bunch of times and get different results, then it tells you nothing. And think, how many people have they used this test for to call racist? Especially kids. When you actually dig into this stuff, it is shocking how little evidence these people have to make such broad claims. And they have been saying this stuff as if it were true for years. Here's a TED Talk from a woman from 2014. Now, she's a good speaker, so she's pretty convincing, unless you actually evaluate her claims. All of her evidence is just personal anecdote, and it's very questionable on whether it's even racist or not. For example, This September, a beautiful, gifted African-American ninth grade girl enters school. Now, this young lady has a goal. Her goal is to go to Cornell and study neuroscience. So as she enters ninth grade, she goes to meet the guidance counselor, as ninth graders do. And as guidance counselors do, she, she sits down with the student and says, well, what is your goal? You know, she goes and says, I want to go to Cornell and be a neuroscientist. To which her guidance counselor reacts, well, that's a, that's a, that's a big dream, but let's look at something more uh, realistic. 
like MCC. In that moment, the student stood stunned as she watched her goal crumble. And people may say, well, Melanie, he's just one person, but he's so much more than that. He was the guidance counselor. How is this racist? He's trying to save her money. He's saying, hey, maybe don't go to an ultra expensive Ivy League school and get into a ton of student debt. Instead, start with a community college and see how you like it. That's perfectly reasonable advice that you would give to anybody if you're good with money. He didn't even discourage her from achieving her dream. I mean, at this point, you guys are just looking to point fingers and put words in people's mouths. The only example of actual racism that this woman gave in her speech was from decades ago when she was a child. Her teacher said something to her that you would be instantly fired for at any school in the modern day. So again, zero evidence that this is a massive problem in the current year. Even Robin D'Angelo, who wrote a really famous book called White Fragility and makes hundreds of thousands of dollars every year talking about this stuff, has terrible evidence of her claims. Do you want to know what her evidence of racism was in that book? A friend of mine felt uncomfortable going to a party. Or, a college professor friend of mine said this, so it must be true. Or, white people are the majority race in America, so they must be bad. Literally, that was her evidence and justification to write quite possibly one of the most racist pieces of literature I have ever read. That is the definition of grifting and making tons of money from misleading people. And the worst part of this is that they are teaching this stuff to young people and treating it as if it were fact, and it's just a thing that everyone accepts when this is a highly contested talking point. My daughter was definitely um, sort of trained with critical race theory, if you like. So she was uh, introduced to terminologies, glossaries, uh, very uh, precise definitions, and they were presented as, as if they were fact, even though really they related to theories which are just ideas, and some people do and some people don't agree with them. Not surprisingly, when this person asked for evidence that this information was factual, they didn't have any. And did you see any credited sources in these materials? When you mentioned, for example, they're pointing at cases in America and cases in Britain, uh, talking about police brutality, was that backed up with data? Uh, very often it wasn't. And uh, in order to find out actually where the material came from, I just wrote a few phrases down and punched them into the internet and would find uh, sources that were very often anything from a teen magazine to something very political, some mainstream media, but often a lot of kind of, uh, you know, sources that you couldn't really even identify the origin of. Um, and I think that concerned me a lot that even, even if the teaching was shown to parents, we weren't actually being told where it came from and what shape was shaping the education. Um, and I think largely some of the staff probably wouldn't even know themselves. And it gets worse than that. Not only are they treating this like fact when they have pretty much no supporting evidence, but they are having students write prompts as if the information were true and as if they were guilty of bad behavior just for being born a certain color. How is this not racist? I was asked to then write a paper about how I was privileged being white, but also marginalized being a woman. So this was some intersectionality paper that we had to write and there was no room for debate because I was thinking, wait, but I don't think that I'm privileged in this way or that I'm marginalized in this way. I, I think uh, I don't really identify with that. There, there's no room for discussion, okay? You're given this narrative and you have to write about how this applies to your life, even if you disagree. They teach you that if you're white, you're racist. You, you may not know it yet, but, but you're racist. And again, I did not agree with that, but I wasn't given a choice to debate. It's like they're forcing you to make stuff up. That is straight up indoctrination. And it seems to be the case that work culture is downstream of college culture. So whatever happens in the colleges will eventually end up in the workplace. This is what you have to look forward to. And then my classes start and there were trigger warnings on every piece of literature. If you had this in your past, if you experienced that, you can leave the class. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. Literally raising toddlers was so annoying. Everything that we read and everything that we watched, the teachers had to put a trigger warning even if it wasn't in any way offensive. This documentary says this curse word. So if you feel offended by this, then you know, let the teacher know and you can exit the classroom during this part of the documentary. This sentiment of babying people was also repeated by the Telegraph writer Juliet Samuel in that interview from earlier. Companies are now expected not just to pay you well um, and you know, make sure that your rights are respected, but they're meant to look after you like a parent, yes. almost, you know, and to, and to 
to coddle you. And you know, this Jonathan Haidt has written about this concept that you know we have a, a generation of people who haven't fully grown up because they haven't been allowed to take risks on their own, and they expect organisations to be their parent more than to to it to be a a transaction, you know, a relationship of of sort of um, you know work for pay or, or you know involving loyalty. And all this really boils down to is censorship of free speech. Now, it's one thing if this kind of just came up organically, but when I see the government, universities, and every major corporation echoing and mandating this stuff, while big tech moves to censor its critics, then combine that with ESG scores that are basically the banks saying, we won't give you loans unless you have certain political values, I go into conspiracy mode. Whether that's the case or not, I always think that when you deal with these kinds of issues, you never start by trying to solve all the world's problems. Do that later. You first have to make sure that you are exempt from this kind of treatment. And the primary thing that binds people to this kind of nonsense is fear of not being able to get a job. So they'll just go along with whatever as long as it pays the bills. To fix that problem and be free of this stuff, or at least free of a lot more of it, you need to get good at finding new jobs. Not only will this keep you away from BS, but it's also the quickest way to increase your salary. Instead of asking for a raise, just find someone who is willing to pay you more. First and foremost, never go through a recruiter or human resources when you're trying to get a job. This is why. Do you know the average time it takes a recruiter to review your resume? Six seconds. That's it. Mostly your resume is just going to get thrown away. So instead, you do whatever you can to meet whoever is responsible for managing that segment of the business, and you try to get to know them. A YouTuber named Joshua Fluke has a lot of videos on how to get around HR. I recommend looking at those. Usually what I would do is call it an information interview where I call the company and say, I'm just looking for information on how to get into this industry and what it's like to work this kind of job. Can I have a meeting with a hiring manager? Managers love talking about themselves and how they got to where they are, so they will probably say yes to a meeting with you, and it's a really easy way to get them to see your face and get them to like you. This is honestly one of the most effective strategies that I've used. Second, and most importantly, you need to get ridiculously good at your job. Jocko Willink says that discipline equals freedom, which means the more disciplined you are in your work ethic, the more freedom you have to go where you want and do what you want. Get so good at your skill that companies cannot afford to fire you or cannot afford to not add you to the team. If you don't know how to do that, I already have lots of videos on all the different ways to skill build, so if you watch more of the channel, you'll learn that stuff. Or really quickly, all skills are built through lots of practice and more importantly, a dedication to learning and trying out new things. The second half of that is what people always miss. Once you're really good at a skill, you have leverage and you can use that against your employer when they try to put you through nonsense like unconscious bias training, especially if you have good communication skills and can leverage multiple people against your employer. Last, unfortunately, this woke HR culture has infected a lot of companies, especially the ones that pay well. At some point, which is now, we're going to have to say no to these ideas by starting our own businesses and out competing the old ones but it's not good enough to just be an alternative option. You actually need to be a better option and provide a better product or experience. I think Elon Musk says it really well here. But if you're entering anything where there's an existing marketplace against large entrenched competitors, then your product or service needs to be much better than theirs. It can't be a little bit better because then you put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and they say, why would you buy it as a consumer? You're always gonna buy the trusted brand unless there's a big difference. You can't just be better. You need to be so much better that people are willing to give up on a product that they already trust. That requires a lot of work, innovation, and learning of new skills. Don't start a business thinking that things are just going to work out. You need to plan this stuff, work ridiculously hard, and think about why someone else would want to buy what you have to offer when there are a ton of other options out there that they are already used to. If you can answer that question, you will be competitive, and then you can exempt yourself from the woke nonsense while at the same time being charitable by providing other people the option to do the same. There are ways to get out of this stuff, and if you aren't of the mindset of being here to save other people, then at least you can work hard enough to exempt yourself from the nonsense and give yourself some peace of mind. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. Follow me on Twitter, and don't forget to click the link in the description to check out established titles to save 10% on your purchase of an official document for yourself or as a gift that will allow you to call yourself a lord or a lady and will protect the environment in Scotland. And remember, use the promo code THINKSLEEP for an additional 10% off. Again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.